Welcome to episode number 11 with John Gomes, chairman of the Energy Project. Many of us have grown up with the idea that excellence is found by having more willpower, more discipline than the other guy. And then when we look at the stories of, of many of the highest performers in lots of different fields, that's often been the story that we've derived from it. It turns out that that's not true. Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. If you are listening for the first time, I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of hardcore IT security, IT business leadership, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and fearless living principles. Welcome to the show. I had a ton of fun interviewing John Gomes, who's the chairman of the Energy Project. I had read his book called The Way We're Working Isn't Working, The Four Forgotten Needs That Energize Great Performance. And I was just truly fascinated with what we talked about. Here's a quote from his book. This is on the section of cultivating the whole brain. Solving problems with insight is fundamentally different from solving a problem analytically. Here's another one. We can't march relentlessly toward a near-term goal and adopt a reflective, big-picture perspective at the same time. It is not the quantity of hours that determines our value. It is the quality and quantity of the energy we bring to whatever we are working on. So the leaders that are listening to this show are interested in being the best that they can be in the latest neuroscience and the latest research that's being done on leadership is not about how to plow the fields even better and more efficient. It's not about how to get things done quicker and faster. Those are important, but a bigger perspective, a ability to synthesize information across domains, the ability to stay calm under pressure, the ability to disengage from work and come home and watch your kids play sports and be with your spouse. These are the qualities of a highly functional leader. So today he talks about the power of presence. We talk about, he talks about the the dangerous myths of multitasking, how to avoid behaviors that are scientifically proven to drop your productivity by 25%. We talk about how to avoid behaviors that drop your IQ by 10 to 15%. The concept of presence in meetings and how the most powerful leaders are completely present in meetings versus having a email device by your side while you're in a meeting, looking at the email, trying to participate in the meeting, looking at the email, participating in the meeting. These are the destructive behaviors of non-productive leaders. So, He works with brands and companies like Yahoo and Google and Sony. So this is not something that the big companies are ignoring. The big companies are totally taking this on. And I want to bring John's message to the masses. So let's jump into this show. You're going to have a lot of fun. Well, John, I want to welcome you to the show today. And this is a unique opportunity and I, I appreciate you for spending the time with me on the show. Your pleasure, Bill. Very glad to be here. So a couple concepts that I, I want to ask you about is the concept of will. And I'm curious about what you're seeing. Why is it not an unlimited resource in the way a leader would approach their work? So this concept of willpower is what I'm referring to. Well, I think uh, many of us have grown up with the idea that excellence is found by having more willpower, more discipline than the other guy. And then when we look at the stories of of many of the the highest performers in lots of different fields, that's often been the story that we've derived from it. It turns out that that's not true, that the, the real essence of willpower is not how much you have, it's how you use it and how you apply it. So the the discipline of automaticity, which is a field of psychology that's relatively new, it's about 30 years old, that studies willpower and discipline. And, and people like Roy Boymaster and Walter Miskow, those people have decoded what willpower looks like. And in essence, what it looks like is that 95% of what we do 
is automatic or reactive. In other words, it's habitual or we're just reacting to, to circumstances. Only 5% of what we do is intentional. And that 5% is our reservoir of willpower and discipline. And the people who perform at the highest levels, what they have recognized is that what you need to try and do is to make the behaviors of excellence become habitual. Therefore, you don't use willpower and discipline to achieve them. That willpower is a very scarce resource and that you use it to, to create new rituals, not to sustain them, because then you're into a zero-sum game. The problem that we face nowadays is that we are just overwhelmed by our lives. We're overwhelmed by the opportunity. We're overwhelmed by distraction. And therefore, you know, this, this reservoir of willpower and discipline is getting drained out. We don't have one for our family and one for you know, that high-value piece of work to do and one for going to the gym. We have one, and when it's drained down in one dimension, it's gone everywhere. And I think that's increasingly one of the problems that we face is that in a world where we're, we've got so much opportunity and we are striving to get excellence, we're finding that more and more of what we do is average. So we're confusing lots of activity with real productivity and real excellence. So the issue really in terms of managing willpower is three things. The first is recognize it's a limited resource. The second thing is that instead of trying to think about it as a resistance-based tech thing, so think of a diet. A diet fails because you resist, you resist, you resist, the willpower is gone and you splurge. So instead of focusing on what you shouldn't be doing, focus entirely on what you are doing. And the third element is this concept of building rituals, which is the more you have to think about doing something, the less energy you have available to actually accomplish it. So we're just encouraging the people we work with to get incredibly, to a much greater level than they ever imagined before, incredibly detailed and specific about defining what a behavior looks like. Because the more you do that, the more you picture this world in which you inhabit, the less energy you have to use to actually do it. And it, it starts to take on its own life. So in this picturing, I picked that up clearly that what I really learned reading the book, The Way We're Working Isn't Working, and listening to you on your YouTube, you talked about this pulsing. And I had, until recently, until reading your book, I really didn't get that concept of 90 minutes, essentially, yes. as real focus and then recovery. I was thinking, well, when I go to bed at night, if I'm lucky, you know, I recover then. And you're turning that whole paradigm upside down. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this, this idea of the performance pulse our most profound energy need is to expend energy and to recover it. Now, we're great at expending energy, and as demand has increased in our, all our lives, the compulsion just to work longer and more continuously in every dimension of what we do becomes overwhelming. What's really deeply counterintuitive is to understand that the highest levels of performance are achieved when we balance the expenditure energy, the kind of if you think about a sine wave going up and down, the, the wave above the normal, the meridian, that's your expenditure wave. And if you want to increase the amplitude of that wave, in other words, you want to find excellence at the margins of endeavor, then you have got to increase the recovery wave. And that, that's counterintuitive, both in the corporate world and, and to somebody who, who is up against a deadline. So where we ground this is, the, what's the most profound form of renewal wave in the body? It's this thing called the ultradian rhythm. Sleep scientists recognized 30 or 40 years ago the concept of the circadian rhythm, and they unpacked it in the 50s and 60s, people like Nathaniel Kleitman. What they discovered was also, which most people are familiar with, there was this kind of oscillating wave that happened during the night. We have different levels of sleep. Well, guess what? That rhythm, that 90-minute rhythm, is running 24 hours a day. Every 90 minutes, you're moving from a physiological peak to a physiological trough. And if you play with that rhythm, if you... Build your day into a series of sprints where you sprint for 90 minutes and then you do a brief period of very effective, deep recovery. Then you can sustain your energy the whole way through the day. You can blast past that you know, circadian trough at 3 o'clock and you can go home with enough energy to truly engage in things that matter for you outside of work as well. And you know, for a very small investment, two or three times a day where you do these deep pieces of recovery, you get tremendous lifts to your performance. So in your book, I was reading that in these ways, you were actually during writing and during some of your creative work, I, I would go out and run as a, like you would burst for 90 minutes and then go out and run. And 
and I was reading that in another book as well, the same thing. And I'm, I'm curious, is there, so that's by exercise. And I, I imagine someone can go walk up and down steps or they could go to the, the gym during the middle of the day. Is that what you're referring to as, as kind of uh, the interlude after a recovery is part of it being exercise? There are several recovery strategies. There's passive and there's active renewal. So passive, it's a renewal is the opposite of whatever you're doing. So if if you're standing up all day, sitting down is renewal. If you're sitting down all day, counterintuitively, standing up is a form of recovery. So, for example, if you're wired, if your body is full of adrenaline and you're stressed, then what you you, recovery can take two forms. It can either take some form of physical activity, which will metabolize those stress hormones and quieten the brain. Or it could be something reflective like meditation or mindfulness. Uh, You know, we, we teach our clients to to do very deep recovery in two minutes but just closing their eyes and counting their breath and what they all are surprised about the first time they do this is just how deep that recovery wave is in such a short period of time the heart rate goes down the stress hormones go down within six seconds of closing their eyes and the ability to gain control of their focus and create a clean slate in their mind means they're not going back to back with activities where the last activity is kind of overlapping on, on the next one. So recovery can take lots of different forms. So it doesn't have to be exercise. You're saying that like a mindfulness approach or breathing exercises. And I, I love your writing about the mindfulness. Uh, I actually took uh, John Kabat-Zinn's MBSR training, which was fantastic. Um, and so are you teaching basically these techniques that a, an executive can basically build into their repertoire where they can focus then then pull out for two minutes, do... Yes. Uh, yeah, so the techniques themselves are not new. What is difficult for people to do is to make them habitual in an incredibly demanding schedule. So when you look at your schedule and you think, well, I've got so many things to do today, the last thing that's on your mind is the idea that by taking a break, you can get more done. But you know, come, I don't know, 2, 3 o'clock, people are starting to fade. They're, they push themselves so hard because they haven't taken any recovery, and they're now starting to rely on very poor forms of fuel. So they're, they're perhaps taking some more coffee, they're having something sweet to try and mainline some energy into the system. But all of those things get you a very short-term lift but followed by a crash, and you're, you're gradually just running down the tank to empty. And what we're showing them is that if you constantly pulse between expending and recovering energy on a much more regular basis and you can sustain your performance over a longer period of time and every person finds for themselves different things so some folks that we're working with in ebay a whole lot of them realized that the most profound thing for them was just putting the headphones on and knowing when to listen to music that lifted them up or music that cooled them down Mm. and they realized that actually for most of us when was the last time you listened to music with the exclusion of doing anything else was when you were a teenager right right you just don't get to do that anymore. And the sheer absorption and joy of just listening to some music you really love and can lose yourself in is an amazing form of recovery in a very short period of time. So as far as meditation and and I find it takes a lot of courage, like how are you to actually give yourself permission if you're one of these top performers or in a management or a leadership role to give yourself permission without guilt to actually partake in these other forms of, re- I mean, a form of recovery. How do you convince them that this is important in culturally and then individually? Yeah, well, I think let, let's start with individually. First okay. of all, you have to make the case for yourself and you have to see the value for yourself. And, uh, you know, the work that we do with people, um, we start to get them to consider that none of the things that, that help you to manage your capacity, manage your energy, are going to come as a surprise to them. They're all things that they have, over a period of time, started to either neglect or devalue because they put work as a much higher priority on the schedule. The biggest challenge facing every human being today in, in the Western world is to, to work less and to do it more effectively. It's not to work more. I don't think many people are going, yeah, Give me more work. (laughs) The prize of of being successful today is literally more work. And in order to be fully successful in our lives, we we need to find a a better balance. So I I think that there is a performance-orientated conversation that individuals and organizations need to have. The first is that if you do these things, you will perform better. You will create more value. 
and you will be more satisfied as well as an individual. So people who take a 90 minute break, we, we just recently did a, a global study with the Harvard Business Review where we interviewed 20,000 people around the world. And the people who took a 90 minute break were 40% more able to think clearly. They were 30% better with their work-life balance and their health. And they had a nearly 30% increase in their focus. So there is a business case sitting here, which says that most people feel overwhelmed. And if you do something different that harnesses your, you know, how you were designed to perform at your best, not only will you perform better, you'll be more sustainable. And yeah. Well, I also, in your book, some of the research that you had met, mentioned about bringing your left and your right brain together and that we get so darn good at optimizing the left brain that, and we get so efficient, so darn efficient and so darn expert at, at one area that we forget that we've got to actually do the pattern recognition and pull that whole piece together and that gets lost. And I'd love you to comment on what happens there and then what you're finding with the brain research as it relates to high performance. Well, I think, you know, the issue of being in a very, many of our, you know, the people that you and I work with, Bill, you know, are finding themselves in a very kind of VUCA world, aren't they? They're, you know, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of their environment is just increasing. So in that world, answers have a diminishing value. And actually what you need to be able to do is to step back and figure out what the best question is to ask. Now, the right brain asks questions that, that make sense of complexity. The left brain just seeks certainty. And it wants to be right, wants to, to go right, what do we do right now? And that gives you a, an increasingly narrow focus. Now, narrow focus is essential for getting things done when you know what to do. The right mode of thought, the creative pattern recognition, emotional brain, sees the big picture, sees what must be done. And to be able to oscillate freely between those two things, between being able to stand back, see the big picture, understand strategically what's going on, and then to be able to focus down and be productive, that's about creating a more flexible brain. And in the face of increased demand, where we don't actually value the freedom to allow our unconscious brain to, to step in, then what we end up doing is creating smaller and smaller ranges of options for ourselves. And that's when organizations start to become irrelevant because everybody can see what needs to be done except the leaders because they're so focused on the, sh the short term and the narrow. So you have to dispel once and for all this concept of uh, multitasking. And yeah. I, a lot of the guys and ladies that I work with in the uh, technology leadership area I mean, it's not just in that area, it's every area, but we want to multitask. And so can you talk about the statistics and how, just the reality of multitasking so that people can sit there and go, you know what, I, you're right. I, if I just focused, I would get more done. But I'd love for you to talk about that because I know you get this question all the time. Well, if, if I ask an audience, do you think multitasking is pretty much your job? 99% of people will put their hands up and say, yeah, that's, that's the job we do. And it's the way that technology has changed the nature of attention. So we're constantly distracted by all these digital devices. They're pinging off all the time. The second thing is that most of us, if we're in a managerial position, we're interrupted consistently throughout the day. The, the, ma the average manager is interrupted by somebody every 10 to 11 minutes. Somebody's walking in saying, I know you're doing something, but could I just... Open plan offices have increased the, the open nature and there's the huge benefits. So the ability to actually concentrate is a huge issue. When we talk about multitasking, multitasking in the past wasn't really a problem for people. You know, if you decided you were going to get and do something, you went off and did it. And, but today, the interruptions are coming primarily from ourselves. We are interrupting ourselves. We've become so used to the instant gratification of that red light pinging off on our BlackBerry or the inbox sending us something, that we've started to confuse productivity with reactivity. And this ties in, Bill, to the whole thing around, around habits. The process of cue, routine, reward, where our brains are constantly automating behaviors, are being triggered into this instantaneous response around email where no matter what else we're doing, a high value piece of intellectual work or an, into a conversation with a colleague where they really need our attention, we're saying, no, 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 I, I just need to look at that email right now, even though we're gonna annoy that person to hell or we're gonna become completely distracted from an, an important task. So 
there are two things to think about. The first is that there is no such thing as multitasking. Multitasking is a, a fallacy. Of course, we can physically multitask, but on a mental level, it's virtually impossible to hold two or more tasks in our mind at the same time and accomplish them. So what you're actually doing is something called switching time, where you're focusing your attention on one task and then you're very instantaneously moving it onto this other task. And the more you move it backwards and forwards, the more you think you're accomplishing both things. But actually what you're doing is disengaging fully from this thing and re-engaging in that. That process of multitasking has three costs. The first is, and researchers like David Myers have validated this, but the first cost is that you add an additional 25% of time to each time you do this to the task. And if the task is cognitively demanding, so it's a, you know, it's a complex report you're reading here or you're, you're working on, and you snack on a piece of email halfway through it, do you start at the beginning or, the, or where you left off? Well, you have to try and put all those threads together. So you completely destroy your focus. And, and you add considerably more time. So that time issue is very significant. The second thing, the second cost is that every time you multitask, your IQ falls significantly, somewhere between 10 to 15 points, which was more than if you were smoking marijuana at work. So it gives you a productivity hit, which you know most of the people we're working with need every single ounce of brain power they can muster to solve the problems facing them. So, you know, this is making them less efficient and it's making them more ineffective. It's robbing them. And the third cost is every time you do this in any form of social setting, you're saying to the other person, you're not worth my attention. So if you're on the phone and you hear a clack, clack, clack of somebody talking to you, uh, you're talking to, and they're, they're obviously writing an email at the same time, you totally disengage and, you know, you, you become sulky. Because they're saying to you, and you're not worth my 100% of my attention. You're worth 30%. So you disengage. Well, you had a, it was a literally one sentence in the book, but I was really curious about this concept of presence. And I feel that when you're talking to someone and you actually are so with them, you can like literally listen to the gaps in their sentences and, and you're there with them. And you made a point about, uh, one of the executives at Sony, it actually wasn't an executive, it was the senior chairman or executive or assistant chairman, and she had that effect with employees. Could you talk about her presence and what that meant to the people around her and that worked with her? If you can remember the story, <laughs> that was a big book. Well, I can, and as somebody that coaches leaders, I know from 30 years of experience of working people that the exemplary leaders are people who who's under their gaze, you feel the only person they're interested in. And in order to be able to do that, it's not a technique. It's not a, you know, like a, a trick. It is, comes out of the genuine ability to do two things. The first is you go, I, I, in this moment, there is value to be had. And I truly value this other person. That creates a motivation in me to, to want to actually to tune in, attune to that other person, to be fully present and to get the most out of that transaction, whatever it is. So that's the first thing. The second element of it is then how do you do that when your brain is you know, constantly being distracted by all of these, these things? And that's what you know, I was referring to earlier on is that we need to build the muscle of deep absorbed attention because it has become so weak. And we see this with children that you know, the, all the, a lot of these issues around attention deficit problems are not brain chemistry issues, they can't be treated, they shouldn't be treated by drugs. What they should be treated by is teaching children and adults how to control their attention, how to literally be able to concentrate for periods of time and build that muscle because all these technologies and a growing kind of habitualization around distraction has meant that, you know, we don't value it anymore. You know, if we're in a meeting, we allow people to be looking at a PowerPoint and doing their email at the same time. Basically what we're saying is, it's okay to opt in and opt out, and, and that's not acceptable. So what I see with, with her and other leaders who are brilliant at valuing the contribution of other people around them is that they, are, they bring a presence to those situations because they're able to marshal their own inner resources effectively in that moment, and they decide that this is important, and then they focus on it like a laser beam, and that person then feels valued. I love that comment, uh, uh, marshalling your own resources. And what's stunning to me when I was listening to you is the productivity decreases 25%. Your IQ drops by 10%, 10 to 15%. And 
I think sometimes people need to understand what the true impact is from the people who research this and, and this brain. And I know just our knowledge of the brain has expanded over the past five years. I don't know what the statistics is, but it's, it's a quantum leap in our knowledge of, of the brain. What is happening in the brain? Is there a dopamine hit that people get from sort of not being present and basically making everything in their environment important? Is that is that what the distraction is? It's like, a, is it an old ancient trigger that's that's causing that? What are your thoughts on that? I think there are several things going on. I think one is that if you look at the science around how habits get formed, there's a part of our brain which is very primitive called the basal ganglia. And it's, you know, every time we perform a task, uh, we lay down neural pathways. And the more we do that in the basal ganglia, the more a behavior becomes habituated. So, you know, if you think about it, it's an energy management system. It's a very positive thing. Now, the question is, are those habits serving you well or are they they're not? You know, um, so habits tend to be word. You know, we tend to think of habits as negative in many ways. So we, we talk about rituals. So the, the process that has been identified is called Q routine reward. So Q is an external stimulus that tells you to do something. So you're driving in your car, you see the stoplight of the car ahead, and you do what? You press the brake. That's the routine. And you get a reward, and the reward is dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter that tells the part of the brain that's responsible for satisfaction, for pleasure, to expect it. It doesn't always get it, obviously, but that's the process. It's a feedback loop. You're driving along in the car and you're the passenger and the driver is going too fast. You see the red light as the passenger. The driver doesn't brake. What do you want to do right now, Bill? If the driver's in front of me, yeah, I mean, then... I, I... Oh, no, you're, you're in the passenger seat of the car and yeah. you're sitting with the driver. What do you feel compelled to do at this moment? Reach over and stop the car. Yeah. Break, don't you? yeah. So you're pushing your foot down, but even though you don't, you know, you don't want to say to the driver that, that that's the case because you don't want to embarrass him. But <laughs> you know, when you don't do this, when you don't act on a behavior, you get this incredible feeling called craving. And this is trying to close the feedback loop. So if you are imagining this in a in a work setting. You're, you've got your BlackBerry, it's on the table in front of you, you're talking to a colleague who's come to you with, with a problem. You know in that moment that that colleague needs 100% of your focus, but you're being cued by your BlackBerry. It's sitting there, it's pinging at you, and you can feel your willpower and discipline now being eroded down. And this craving, this automatic craving that's being created to close the feedback loop is distracting you. Now, clearly, the answer here is, that resistance is futile. If you put that thing in front of you, if your BlackBerry is in front of you in that situation, at some point, your capacity to be able to resist it is going to be gone and you'll look at it and then you'll destroy the semblance of attention that you're paying to this person. So one of the things that we've got to learn is how to avoid negative cues and find better routines because you know the compulsion to do things like this is just so overwhelming. This is why people eat while they're watching television after being full. There's a whole bunch of, of negative habits that people adopt because they're being cued beyond their conscious awareness. So, so it seems to me that dopamine is probably one of the more powerful drugs. I mean, I, I'm not a brain scientist, but I can actually picture myself in a meeting with all my electronics off to the side and I'm trying to pay attention and I'm being cued, even though the machine's not making a noise at me, mentally, I'm sitting here going, I wonder if that email has been that I sent earlier has been responded to. And you, are you saying that that takes away from our ability to be present and to really be with the situation that, in the moment? Absolutely. If performance is achieved through absolute focus on what you're doing in the moment, then anything that, that is distracting you from that is a performance issue and if we want to kind of just pull back for a moment and think about what's been happening in our lives we have moved increasingly to a point where the lines are blurred between every dimension of our lives not just work life but also in work when you went to an off-site or when you got onto an airplane or whatever those were the moments where you had the chance to stand back and do the reflective thinking and you got into a different performance state. You felt different. You saw the world differently. You, you had expansive thinking. Your right brain had a chance to become dominant. Today, we have very little of those opportunities. 
So the skill set that we need to relearn or to, to learn, maybe not relearn, but we need to, to learn for the 21st century is about how to intentionally put boundaries back in place and to manage transitions so that we can intentionally create these places to have states. So what's the transition between work and home? What's the transition between one meeting and another? What's the transition between doing and thinking? We need to intentionally put those things back because if we go into a, a thinking situation with a doing mode, what will we get? We'll just, we'll, we'll either engineer the wrong outcome or we'll upset people or we'll feel very deeply frustrated that we're unable to make breakthroughs. So we have to become very intentional putting boundaries and transitions back into our lives where they now no longer exist. And, and really this concept of work-life balance almost seems to me to be like an old word at, that I'm not sure there is such a thing in today's to have balance, but, but to have segmentation and, and like you're just mentioning, to be consciously aware because I guess we're coming back to the mindfulness pieces here. These are subtle urges that all of a sudden hijack us. Our urges are leading us. Like it's almost like our urges are leading us instead of us leading the program. We're letting all of our habits lead the program. And that seems like a big, a big challenge. So a lot of the companies you mentioned were West Coast companies. I'd love to hear what they're doing because I'm in the East Coast of the U.S., and I can guarantee you we're about five years behind the West Coast as far as these concepts. Can you give me some of your thoughts on, on that? The things they're doing, um, I don't think are going to come as a surprise to you. I think it, what it boils down to is the commitment behind them because organizations are great at starting things. They're not great at seeing them through. We hear that time and time again. Let's try something new. Let's. Oh, it's exciting. The issue uh, with getting value from something is that it becomes part of who you are. So we can all, you know, at an individual level, we can all go on a diet two or three times a year and then, you know, watch our weight balloon up and down or we can go to the gym and put a bit of muscle on, a bit of core stability and then let it, you know, that's not the challenge. The challenge is actually doing something so that it becomes a competency that's part of who you are. So one of the things that I've been really impressed about with, with some of our clients, uh, and I wouldn't put the West Coast in some sort of um, paradigm, <laughs> because uh, we've, we've got some great Asian and European clients who've been real pioneers and innovators. We did some very simple experiments, which we measured the outcomes on. So we were in a, a big software company. Uh, it happens to be based in Palo Alto. But anyway, we'll, we'll put that to one side for a moment. What they did with about 1,500 engineers is that we taught them some of these concepts. And they did uh, two things, which are really interesting. The first is that they, they started to look at meetings in a completely different way. And they said, meetings sap people's energy. They feel very unproductive. We often find that you know, things don't get done. Collaboration is poor. And, and you know, all the things that people complain about meetings. So we did two things with meetings. The first is that we gave them permission to, to come up with a, a different way of thinking about time and meetings. So the first thing was that the 15 minutes to the hour, so quarter to the hour, no meetings at all. Which means, because you know, most of the problem is that people just have back to back, nobody's in control of the schedule for anybody. So there's no time to prepare for meetings. There's no time to metabolize what I've just come up with. There's no time to deal with emails. And so I end up with two, three, four hours of work after all these meetings to do other things. Which means that, you know, I'm in this kind of nightmare scenario of never really being able to be at my best and never getting on top of what I'm trying to do. So by building this period of recovery, renewal and preparation into the schedule, creating a performance pulse, that drove engagement scores in the organization by about 40% in three weeks. It just went shot up. People were going, oh my goodness, this is, this is incredible. What's an, I, what's an engagement score? What does that, what does that mean, um, an engagement score? Engagement is the degree to which people feel willing, the, the ableness to bring uh, discretionary effort to what they do. So, you know, what companies are trying to measure all the time is, you know, this is your job. How motivated are you to want to do it? And engagement measures the willingness to, to deliver discretionary effort, that extra mile. Now, the difference between in traditional engagement scores is that if you look at the there's 200 studies across the world that show this, that the lowest levels of engagement, the average operating margins of companies is about 10%. For, for companies that, that have traditionally high levels of engagement scores, it's somewhere around 14%. However, the companies that have 
we refer to as sustainable high levels of engagement, i.e. people can do this over a long period of time, they have almost double that, 27% operating margins. So clearly something's going on here. You know, we are in a world where discretionary effort is the key to high performance. You were at 4-0, 40%. Well, no, sorry, the, the improvement of 40% it, over where they were. They didn't get to 40% of, um, uh, you know, they were, I think they were somewhere at a, probably about 70% and they had a 40% improvement on that. It's a very significant marker. And uh, anecdotally, people were saying things like, this is the most single most productive thing that's ever happened in our organization to improve performance. That was the first thing they did. The second thing they did, which came as a shock to many people, was the CEO stood up at the end of the intervention that we managed and said, no email at the weekends from now on. None. If anybody sends an email over the weekend, and you can write the email, I'm not sending it till Monday. If anybody sends an email, forward it on to me, I will directly talk to that person. <laughs> it was this collective cheer. You know, 1,500 people just started cheering. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that our world is now defined by such simple things? Now, those two, those two uh, little activities led to a whole range, because it, the benefits for such small changes led to a whole range of people going, right, let's do different things. So one team came up with this idea of 0, 15, 30. How many meetings could we get rid of? That was the zero. How many meetings, uh, if there's just one decision, could be reduced down to 15 minutes? And how many meetings, if we just made it a single topic, as opposed to an agenda that's like, you know, 100 things that we don't really accomplish properly, could we do in half an hour? Because one of the observations when we sat around was that people go into meetings, they, tend, they take 10 minutes to start working. And then when they're finished, if the meeting finishes at half past, they carry on for the next 20, 30 minutes doing nothing really other than just filling the time up. Oh, we're here anyway, so we might as well just carry on. So this relentless focus on being efficient with time. So it's not to say that every meeting should be you know, 15 or 30 minutes. It's just to say, can we reframe how we think about, about the, the use of the most expensive time that we have when we bring people together? And all of these things just started to energize people, get them to think differently about their time. So let me so, let me clarify, let me make sure I, I've got this right. So in this company, they shorten the time for meetings to 45 minutes. Basically, the last quarter hour, they would shut down the meeting. There was a real discipline about the length. And, yes. and what you're saying is that then that helped their engagement. So basically, because you're respecting everybody's time, that they were more engaged in the way you're say, saying that is they're much more um, willing to take on, uh, you didn't use the word extra effort, but maybe you could just clarify that. Did I get that first part correct? Yeah. So I think what was going on is that the central observation that we had is that most people felt that there weren't enough hours in the day to get things done and that they were overwhelmed. So their feeling was lack of control. Now, these are very highly paid, very precious resources of the organization who are feeling disengaged, not because they, they're not on mission, not because they're not wanting to be there, but, but they actually feel that the way that they're working stops them from bringing their best to the enterprise. So when someone starts to feel a lack of control, issues set in, morale, a degree of victimness, uh, you know, and for high performers to feel that they're victims to a situation is not good. Then, then they start to behave in pretty counterproductive ways. So what we were doing, in essence, was giving them a very simple technique to gain control of their schedule, their time, their focus, and the demands of them, so that they could choose more about what they were doing and be more choiceful in it. And it was a very simple thing, but what it did was it disrupted flatlining. If you think about you know, this idea of the wave, the wave is in itself inherently about valuing recovery and expenditure when you start to flatline that's when things break down yeah and yeah it's, it's like a grind you you're sort of like a grinding through plowing the field when we are not trying to bulk plow a field you want these very high performers to to not be grinding all day to introduce that pulse is what i'm hearing you say is you basically inserted a pulse wave into into the way they're operating meetings right absolutely stress isn't the enemy continuous stress is the enemy because over a period of time what ends up, you get into this gray zone where you're neither off nor on, you never recover at the weekends, and all you do is just kind of get back to 
being able to cope on a Monday morning because you didn't recover properly the weekend. You were sitting watching your kids playing ball, but you were doing some email at the same time. And you were getting you know, annoyed by the fact that someone was asking you to do something over the weekend that you can't really do. And then you look up and you realize that you missed the strike that your kid achieved or whatever. And you kind of feel angry with yourself. You feel angry towards them because they're cutting into, you know, <laughs> that, isn't, that isn't a way of, of, of performing at a high level. But that kind of is happening across the piece for many people. So this, this idea of stop flatlining and start performing is, is really important in, in this overload world. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, just even being at my my son's uh, soccer, I coach and, and I observe him as just a re- as a regular parent. Um, and I was sitting there on the on the sideline watching, and I had my uh, Droid phone with me. I was consciously made a decision to put it away, but I know a couple years ago I would not have made that decision. So it's interesting that conscious awareness of building that in. It's like it's interesting because my next question is like, is it individually? Are you finding the successes? or if you target the right individuals in a company, that they can actually institute these suggestions without necessarily full buy-in at the top? Or what are your thoughts there? Well, I think anybody can leverage these ideas in a personal dimension because you know, ultimately you have a responsibility to your own life um, because you know, the, there are short-term benefits of all of these things, but there are also long-term costs to your health, to your relationships outside of work. And ultimately you're, you're responsible for those things. You know, the organization that you work for might create a condition where you know managing them is difficult, but ultimately, if you look back over your life and you say, I was a victim, my health, my, my marriage, or my relationship with my children was victim to the organization I work with, who's responsible for that? So ultimately, we're, we're expecting individuals to question themselves and take responsibility, and they can do things that are practical within the context of even very demanding environments. Having said that, we are really, really focused on helping leaders to recognize that their energy is contagious and disproportionately influential. So the concept of the CEO, the chief energy officer, the leaders today, their responsibility is to mobilize, to focus and to renew the energy of the organization. Um, that's a, that's a, a focus point for a conversation with leaders that we're having all around the world right now. Yeah, that human error at work piece kind of hit me like a two by four, because uh, as I looked to find my notes, it was it was interesting the role you put the leader in from helping develop the uh, meaning. I like how you kind of mix spirituality and meaning. I thought that was an interesting w- t- way to do that. Um, and as one of the primary roles, helping the organization, what is the, find meaning? Can you kind of give people an understanding of what you found in the Harvard study with the energy project on, as it relates to, I know there are four steps. That would be interesting hearing this, your comments on the spiritual side. Let's just build it for a second. So okay. the four dimensions of energy in the human system, the base is physical, and that's about the quantity of fuel in your tank. Emotional energy is about the quality. Is it positive? Is it negative? And we, we have this concept of the performance zone, the high positive emotional state that we're truly at our best. Mental energy is about your capacity to focus and concentrate. And as we've just you know, talked about and explored, there are two forms of focus. The wide focus generated by the, the, the kind of creative, interpretive brain, the sometimes referred to as the, the right mode, and the more uh, language-based part of the brain, the left brain. So those physical, emotional, and mental dimensions of energy are the how of energy management. That, that's the kind of the practice, the technique of building capacity in the human system. Spiritual energy is different from those because it's the thing that wraps around all of that. It's the sense of meaning and significance in what I do. Uh, another way of putting it is about your deepest sense of motivation. And it, it poses a question to each of us, which is, who am I and what do I want? And when we have an answer to that question, then virtually anything is possible because it's the it's the primary driver in our life. And if I think about the journey that I've been on, I probably 10 years ago was, not 10, maybe 12, 15 years ago, I was the classic burning out CEO of an organization. You know, I did some of the things, but, you know, I didn't do many of them well. And I was exhibiting some of those costs. When I started to, to, to really embrace this work at the deepest level, I saw the truth of why dealing with my physical energy, for example, was in service of my spirit. 
So it had, a, a, you know, I wasn't doing it because it was the right thing to do in its own terms. It's just, you know, being healthy. I'm doing it because the motivation, who do I want to be? Well, I want to be a parent that has enough energy to engage with my children, to, to really concentrate on helping them, to really to get the most out of every moment that I'm with them and, and my wife, rather than being the slightly tired, demotivated parent that's going, you know, I work so hard for you kids and you're not grateful. Now leave me alone. Who's in a semi torpor on the, on the sofa on, on Sunday. Now, I don't want to be that person. Uh, I want to be a person that's getting the most out of that every moment. And so what spiritual energy gives you is a real source of probably the most powerful energy that there is, which is to address what's important in my life and am I putting my energy into it? Are those two things aligned? Because when I make that conscious choice, then, as I said, I think so much more is possible. And, and people who feel a sense of meaning and significance are nearly 100% more engaged. Um, they're, they're nearly 200% more likely to stay in your organization. And, and, you know, we did a global study in a big tech company that is losing 25% of its A players every year. In other words, its best people are turning over completely every four years. And we asked them, because they didn't know, what's the number one reason you're leaving? And, you know, of course, all of these people are going to the competitors. They're going to Apple, they're going to Google, they're going to Facebook and so on. So there's a big swarm of all this. So the company got this resigned place where, well, we can't do anything about it. It's just the market. No, it's not. As it turns out, the number one reason why people join this company is to make a difference. And when their experience of work isn't about making a difference, when they encounter roadblocks or they encounter things that are counter, you know, stop them from doing that, then they leave. It's not about money. It's not about you know, anything else. Status. It's about this contribution. So when you have an organization that is asking that question the whole time, are we creating meaning and significance for people? Are we doing it, you know, from from mission at the top right down to experience at the, uh, at the lowest levels of the organization, when you infuse that idea of spirit into an organization, then people are on a mission, they bring more of their value because they can see how they're aligned to that. And you know, the best companies in the future will recognize that that isn't like putting a bumper sticker on it. It's not saying we do good things. No, it's not. It's about how human beings bring their greatest value to any enterprise. I can't agree with you more. I mean, I, in 2008, I, I checked myself into uh, the emergency room because I thought I was uh, having a heart attack and um, getting build, building the company through the startup level and, and getting it to where it had to be. And, um, and I ended up not having a heart attack. But the guy, uh, the cardiologist said, look out there in, the, in my waiting room. There were basically a bunch of 70 year olds. He says, uh, you can join that crew in a couple of years if you don't get your, your life in order. And the problem that happens is we get really good at all the techniques and, and get really smart about the techniques, but we forget to wrap it in a bigger why. And I, that's what I really appreciated about your work was there was really great cutting edge science and approaches and strategies, but then wrapping it with that bigger purpose. And it's really encouraging to see that being done at really large companies that, you're, that you've engaged with, like Sony's and these bigger enterprises, because if it can work there in very big, complex environments, it can go really anywhere. And I, lo I love that. Oh, and I, I think there is a shift in consciousness that's taking place where more and more leaders are recognizing that people want something different from work. And one way of describing this shift is that if you think about the 20th century model of an organization is that you, know, you hire really smart intellectual people to build a big system and grow it and grow it and grow it. And it makes more contribution to for shareholders. And most people's experience of that company is that they service the company. They have they conform to what the company needs from them. What I think is taking place, and we see this with some companies like Facebook, which is are they intentionally saying, no, that's not what a company's for. What we want is a group of people who are able to perform at their best. And what the organization should be about is providing the systems, the, the processes, the spirit, the ethos, the mechanisms to enable them. So instead of us being in service of the organization, the organization is in service of our performance. And that is fundamentally different. And I think that that is the consciousness shift 
that we will see increasingly. It's not easy because we are still we're kind of like between two worlds and the you know the kind of rational defense of the status quo will rise up in the face of, of these ideas and say, oh, it's new age mumbo jumbo and it's you know but there's a reality which is that you know if you create an organization that's very inflexible in the face of of our VUCA world, it will crumble um, because people aren't sustainable in that environment. You know, if you look at these incredibly agile organizations who are able to change themselves regularly, you don't do that just intellectually. You do it because you care. You do it because you fundamentally are part of, of, of a, a movement, a cause, a, a thing you believe in. And that's, that's liberated by people being able to sustain that through their, their physical, their emotional, their mental and their spiritual capacity. I'm not sure it, how much you've done in this, but I'm curious uh, the complexity. I often do this uh, kind of presenting on the on the technical side to to my audiences, but uh, right now the the globe is essentially the complexity of one human brain, with all of the connected devices and such uh, around the world, and of course that's growing exponentially. And so it would it would uh, make sense, and I, I'm getting this from from reading some of Kevin Kelly's work, but I'm, it makes sense of your approach because essentially complexity is going north and we can't handle that with old industrial age concepts. We've got to like totally revamp the way we approach um, our entire way we approach our life. And so is there a lever that is causing this to happen that you're saying that, that we need to apply this or, or is there any particular lever that you're saying uh, we, that we have to make this change from a leadership point of view? The way that that consciousness develops within you know in in a society is really interesting. We look at what's happened over the last hundred years. We've gone through levels of consciousness development, and they seem to be speeding up. So things that were previously unimaginable have become more imaginable. You know, the society has changed beyond belief in the last forty or fifty years. If you think about uh, how racial societies are integrating. You think about the gay rights movement, and yeah. you know now, you know, gen my my generation of children, uh, our generation of children, are growing up thinking that you know gay marriage is completely normal. You know, my parents would have seen it as completely, uh, you know, like what? <laughs> if you think about how consciousness is accelerating and our ability to to go through these different stages of, of consciousness, we're moving with that. I think is a force that we don't get to control. I think that's happening and you're either on the bus or you're not. And so if you want to be an organization that's bound by the limitations of the 20th century, then, you know, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a rocky ride because you're going to lose all the best people. They don't want to be part of that. The ones that stay will be victims. Um, and you'll just start to see your margins go down, down. And, and ultimately what you do is you're, you're creating a defense of the status quo. So you, you will you create a, a fairly negative, toxic environment. And of course, there are strangleholds on markets and so on that you can defend for periods of time. And, you know, if you're in that, there's no incentive to change. I like to look at this, you know, the, the thing about business is that I like to think about it in, in very simple terms of, what a wonderful life you have if you can truly be your best. And I, I you know, I started the, uh, the journey with Tony Schwartz at the Energy Project with a simple question. What kind of company would I want my children to work with in the future? Where would I be truly proud that, you know, that their talents were truly recognized, their potential was, you know, fully realized? And if I look at many of the people I've worked with over the years, many of the companies, I, I'd be asking that question. I'd be quite worried about whether they would truly have that potential. Now, maybe that sounds, uh, you know, utopian, but that's what's driving me. I, I think that, you know, more organizations have the potential to truly tap into the, the, uh, the full spectrum of what human beings can to deliver. And when they do, it's amazing. And some very simple shifts will make that possible. So one of my last questions for you, uh, John, is what does it mean to you to live a no limits life? Uh, well, I suppose the first thing is that when, you know, you think about what human beings, what bounds them, fear is the, the clear thing that we're constantly moving away from. And we're, we're afraid of lots of things. We're afraid of 
uh, of the unknown. We're afraid of feeling things. We're afraid of making mistakes. We're afraid of. So the, the first question that I ask myself whenever I'm learning something new is what am I afraid of? You know, wh wh where is fear clouding my judgment? Because cognitive bias is in extreme when you're afraid. You don't make good choices. You don't think about, you know, what's possible. And, uh, you know, to live a life that's full, you don't want to be bound by fear. So that's the, the constant thing I ask myself. What am I afraid of here? And am I, what, am I right to be afraid? <laughs> because, you know, you don't want to be reckless and make stupid mistakes. But um, often the fears are, are, are not grounded in anything that's real. They are just a kind of fight or flight response telling us a story. So, um, you know, that, that's the starting point. I want to create a world of abundance. I want there to be more, not less, of the things that matter. And I think you can engineer that by just starting to, to peel back the things that, that you, you stop doing because of fear. So tell the, our listeners how they can get in touch with yourself, the Energy Project, any information. I'm going to provide links to show notes and all of that for, for all of our listeners. But just about the Energy Project and about what you're doing with the organization and your team's doing, um, can, you, can you let us know about, about it and, and how we may uh, reach out to you if, so, if, we, if we desire to? For individuals who want to know more about our work, the, the, the places to go are theenergyproject.com, our website, um, our Facebook page, where there's loads of resources for people. Um, you referred to our book very kindly. Thank you. Uh, the way we're working isn't working. That, that is full of practical resources for people. Tony Schwartz has a Harvard Business Review blog, which is uh, very popular, and also uh, a New York Times blog. So there are very practical suggestions and, and thought pieces in there. We have a Twitter account and, and so on, as you might expect. We work with organizations. We deliver programs based on a concept called People Fuel, which teaches individuals how to build their capacity across those four dimensions. And uh, you know, occasionally we run open programs as well. So if you get in touch with us, uh, via our website, we can tell you more about those things. Um, but you know, our mission is to to create healthier, happier, more productive, and more meaningful environments. And um, you know, we're not the only people embarked on this. We're part of, a, I think, a, a global consciousness movement. And uh, you know, we'll love to hook up with anybody that um, feels they've got a contribution to make in this. Well, I, I would I would say that you uh, are leading the charge as far as businesses are concerned and bringing that higher level of consciousness to, I, and I just love that. I mean, it's one thing to talk about it from a new age angle when you're only dealing with new agers, but when you're dealing with traditional businesses that are trying to come out of an industrial age concept, this is the greatest stuff. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book. I mean, I would love books that you can read from front to back, back to front, pick up the book in the middle, and you can just, you, you have 15 minutes, you just read the middle. I mean, it's it's wonderful. And, and I really appreciate that. And also the resources that you've extended to people to reach out to you for further knowledge and information. So I thank you for your time uh, on, the, on the show and I uh, hope we can do this again in the future. Thank you, Bill. It's a real pleasure. And very, very kind comments about our, our work. Thank you. Well, that wraps up another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to John Gomes. And I'm going to leave all show notes on my blog site in two locations, one on LinkedIn and the other at redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. Again, that's redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. You can also find me on LinkedIn and you can find access to the show notes there as well. I appreciate you very much for listening. And if you've enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes if you're an iPhone user and leave a comment there. It really helps out the show. And as well, if you are a Droid user, which I am, go to Stitcher, stitcher.com and leave comments there as well. Or if you just like to stream the show through your PC or Mac, then you can find us on SoundCloud. So either way, I look forward to you joining us on our next episode. So have a great day. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. 
Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.